All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Trapp will send her regrets. She's on a grant review today. So she will not be joining us to introduce seminar. So my name is Brianna McIntosh. I'm the Director of Research Operations at the Prevention Research Center. And I'm also a member of Team Cook Bailey and will be presenting later on today. I wanted to introduce Dr. Cook Bailey and the rest of our team, Dr. Sarah Kennedy, Dr. Sarah Koopman Gonzalez, and Dr. Andrea Wak Waksmunski. Um, today we are presenting um, findings on the study, All Eyes on Us, Community-Based Perspectives on Health and Vision Care here in Cleveland. Uh, Jess, it's not letting me go forward. Oh, there you go. Um, as always, just want to share our social media handles for the PRC. Please follow us on Twitter if you don't already. And also check out our website. We always have um, updates on there, our newsletters, events for both the Prevention Research Center and other campus and community events going on. Um, so please follow us on there and also our YouTube and Facebook. We also wanted to make a plug for the March sem seminar. Uh, Dr. Elaine Borowski will be presenting on Fresh Finder, which is an interactive food access map that uses the Neighborhood Environmental Assessment Project data, which is food retail data across Cleveland. So we will be uh, sharing that information at the March seminar and the link is in the chat to register for next month. A little bit of housekeeping. We would love to hear who's here with us today. If you could put your name and your organization in the chat. Um, also feel free to come on camera so we can see your faces. It's really great to be able to be in this mode so we can see who's in the room with us today. And as always, if you have any questions, please type your questions into the chat. Toward the end of the, uh, the, end of the presentation, we will take time to answer any questions and have a dialogue around the, today's presentation. And then I just want to quickly go over the group of women that we have here today. Um, our bios, full length bios are in the flyer that was sent around, but I quickly wanted to go over who's here. Dr. Cook Bailey is an assistant professor in the Department of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences and the Cleveland Institute of Computational Biology here at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Cook Bailey's work on genomic is as a genomics data scientist has encompassed many aspects of statistical and computational analyses of complex diseases. Dr. Cook Bailey's research program overall focuses on primary open angle glaucoma by characterizing and quantifying clinical lifestyle and environmental and genetic differences within, a, within and among diverse groups of, to identify risk factors, determining how genetic ancestry mediates genomic risk and determining how effectively to translate this risk information to clinical and community stakeholders. Dr. Sarah Kennedy is a, P, is a study coordinator and research associate in the Department of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences in the School of Medicine here at Case Western Reserve. Dr. Kennedy received her PhD in sociology and is trained as an applied sociologist and has an extensive background in par participant recruitment and community outreach and engagement. Dr. Sarah Koopman Gonzalez is a research scientist in the Department of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences at the Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods. She earned her PhD in anthropology from Case Western Reserve. Dr. Koopman utilizes, uses qualitative methods to examine factors that influence health and well being with a particular fo focus on um, nicotine and use and cessation, but also around qualitative and community evaluation. And then there's me, my name is Brianna McIntosh, the Director of Research Operations here. On Team Cook Bailey, I assist in strategic planning and expansion of domestic and international studies. Um, I have my background uh, if, in public health from the University of Pittsburgh, and I have a background in global health and health equity. And last but not least is Andrea Wasminski. She's a PhD postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Population Health and Quantitative Health Sciences. She received her PhD in genetics and genome sciences at Case Western Reserve in 2020. And her dissertation focused on applying statistical methods and molecular methods to integrate the genetic architecture of age-related macular de degeneration. We've got a great group of people here today with long bios and um, appreciate everybody being here today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cook Bailey who will lead the presentation. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Bree. It is um, a delight to be here with all of you today. Um, so today we're gonna talk about a project that's really unlike any other study that I have uh, worked on. And through this presentation, I hope to highlight to all of you the value of transdisciplinary research. Um, and before I go any further, I want to reiterate Bree's point um, that we have an incredible team. And I, this presentation is probably unlike many that you've gone to uh, because we're going to have multiple of the team members presenting. And I'm really excited to do this in this format today because um, I, I'm not gonna get up here and pretend like I'm the expert on the project. It really, it really is all of us that are here today and additional team members that were unable to join. So here's the outline of our presentation, which we will um, follow and try to get through as much information as possible during this time. So I'm gonna start out and wrap up this session by sharing part of my own story with you. I am a former KL2 scholar. I finished my support on the CTSC KL2 in April of 2020. So just at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, I study the worldwide most common cause of irreversible blindness. It's called primary open angle glaucoma. You'll hear us refer to it as POAG. This is a complex disease, meaning that has multiple contributing factors that affect risk. Um, and these are both genetic, uh, which is where I specialize, and non-genetic. It's estimated that the genetic component is quite high. Some estimates say up to 90%. And in the past nine years, I've worked with the largest consortia in the country and in the world, actually, studying the genetics of this disease. Um, we incorporate various risk factors um, that are shown here in this diagram that's shaped like an eye. During that time, we have looked at samples of tens of thousands of individuals to better understand genetic contributors to this disease. Um, and we look at tens of thousands or millions of single nucleotide variants, which are represented by um, the other figure on this slide. So often, however, we really have focused on the most readily obtainable samples, and those are generally from individuals of European descent. And this is despite that we know that POAG is more pre prevalent, more aggressive, and starts at younger ages, and is more likely to cause blindness in people of African descent. I've spent a lot of time thinking about how this issue, um, about this issue, and specifically when I started my KL2 in 2016, I was focusing mainly on the genetics um, of the disease and how that might impact differences, um, especially thinking about uh, people of African descent. But I was challenged by one of my amazing mentors, director of the PRC, Dr. Erica Trappel, who can't be here today, as Bree mentioned. Um, I was challenged to think about reasons that there are fewer diverse people in genetic studies uh, in general, and specifically in POAG, and why people of African descent and also of low socioeconomic status experience worse POAG, and maybe what those reasons might be other than genetics. My first inclination was to talk to ophthalmologists who verified that yes, they do have a lot more African-American patients in their clinic. And not only that, but the disease is worse, more aggressive, begins earlier and is less responsive to treatment. But they couldn't tell me why. So from there, I feel like I've been challenged to think more holistically about glaucoma risk. And so we thought, well, why don't we think about how to get an idea from the people who actually experience the disease. Which of course meant we need to ask the people at highest risk for the disease. We decided that we might eventually wanna have an engaged genetic research study, but we really first needed to focus on the engagement part. So as I read more, as I read more about the importance of engagement, it became clear to me why this was so important. Now, I know a lot of folks who do research that falls in the left column on this screen, okay? So a hands-off research study where researchers get the data they want, they publish to the scientific community, and there are possible translational and health impacts. But I really wanted to approach this work, given the challenge from Dr. Trappel, differently. What really drove me was the potential for greater research impact. And when we started thinking about what the people at high risk might need, need, not just what I needed from them, which would be their data, 
it really challenged me to think about it differently. So I, I again, will say there are various types of genetic studies that have illuminated the importance of this type of work. Um, but it's important for people to be able to access the information that is gleaned from research, especially about them. Not only looking at them as research subjects, but also as partners being involved in and or able to access the knowledge that's gained from their data. So thinking back to a few slides ago, the beginning of my story, I'd really been focused on identifying genetic risk factors for glaucoma, but I wasn't thinking holistically about that research. And using this engaged research study approach that you see on the right side of the slide, I started thinking about how we might approach including communities that are affected by glaucoma in the work that we wanted to do. So obviously we need more brains than mine on this in order to truly ask the right questions that would help us understand this very complex problem. So being a KL2 scholar at the time through that experience and having become a big proponent of team science, um, which is described here as a collaborative effort to address a scientific challenge that leverages the strengths and expertise of professionals trained in different fields. I wanted to create a team, create, have a team science approach to this problem, okay? Um, what does team science look like for us? Um, our team's mission statement is, let's see if I can click and it'll come up for you down here in yellow. Um, and thankfully I work in this department, Population and Quantitative Health Sciences or PQHS, um, which is an incredibly multidisciplinary department. Um, so in addition to housing the PRCHN um, who are generously hosting us today, PQHS also hosts the Cleveland Institute for Computational Biology where my faculty position is supported. Um, and both of those entities, in addition to the CTSC pilot, um, supported the project that we're going to talk about today. Okay, so this slide here is highlighting the research spheres that we can bring from PQHS and that we brought to this project from our department. Okay, so CICB, PQHS, PRCHN. We have clinical research, sociology, epidemiology, neuroscience, bioethics, nutrition, public health, anthropology, and genetics. Wow, what a mouthful. And here we placed photos of individuals from the team who fit within each of these. Um, and you're gonna hear from a couple of them today and you know probably others of them. So this bringing all of these individuals together um, with these diverse backgrounds is what created our Case Western research team. And um, so we, we looked at everyone, we looked at everyone in, as a group, we looked at everyone and their individual expertise. And um, here, here on the slide are the roles that each person um, on the team would have. <clears throat> so important for us, right, is that we work in Cleveland, um, which is a pretty diverse city. Um, and we know, I know, right, that there are various ophthalmological care sites in Cleveland, and this, uh, just the ones off the top of my head, right, we have University Hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, um, the VA Hospital, and then Metro Health. Um, so we have a diverse city, we have lots of eye care entities, what else do we need to really know? Well, if we're thinking about which particular community we want to start with, um, what we did is look at the neighborhoods around Case Western. So we noticed diversity on this table, uh, differing levels of poverty, lack of insurance. And we really focused this work in Broadway Slavic Village. Um, one of the reasons that we wanted to work in Broadway Slavic Village is um, it, there's approximately half white and half black or African-American um, citizens in this in this area, community members. Um, so that aspect of this neighborhood, we hope, would help us look at similarities and differences within and across race groups, and then also income groups. But obviously, we can't just show up in a neighborhood and start asking folks 
to help us to be in our research project because who are we to them? We can't just start posting flyers and be like, hey, can you be in our research? So what we were missing is community representation. So we realized that we were missing that as well as community knowledge. And so at that point, we engaged with University Settlement, a community research resource center in Broadway Slavic Village, um, which noted on the slide prior is the second poorest neighborhood in Cleveland. Um, it's crucial for me to say that these folks pictured here and a couple others that we couldn't get photos of were partners in this work as well. So Earl Pike, the executive director of University Settlement, really led us in to the resource center and gave us access to their group. Um, and there are reasons for that, which we'll get into in just um, a moment, but we really were very fortunate to be able to connect with, with these folks and to be able to work with them and to bring them into this work with their spheres of knowledge um, that we were obviously missing. <clears throat> so really quickly, University Settlement is a 501c3 nonprofit. They have been providing services in Broadway Slavic Village neighborhood since 1926. They, their programs focus on the community, but also um, they have specific services for youth, seniors, and families. Um, one of the things that I want to mention here that we did that was important for both groups, for the Case Western team, as well as the University Settlement team, is that we had a memorandum of understanding where we listed our commitments, from each side, our expectations, and how we wanted to work together. Um, this was really a document of transparency. It had our expectations in there. We came to it to University Settlement in one of our meetings with this document and then went back and edited it based on their input and then brought the final document to another meeting. And we actually all signed it. Um, and I have a copy of that with all of our signatures somewhere. Um, and I really felt like that set the tone for moving forward and working with them as partners and not just us using them. <clears throat> so finally, at this point, we feel like we have most of the expertise that we needed. So um, we have all of these different facets represented. We have expertise um, in different areas, roles for each group, and then within each group, each individual's um, contribution to the team approach. Okay, so working together <clears throat> as a CWRU group, as well as with the University Settlement Group, we um, established study aims for our CTSC pilot. And that was based on numerous meetings. Um, so we decided that we wanted to establish a community advisory board or a CAB made up of Slavic Village neighborhood residents to create an interview guide to be administered by our research team. And then we wanted to assess perceptions, values, and barriers to vision health care among Slavic village neighborhood residents. And our study hypothesis was that we could establish basic knowledge to identify perceptions of and barriers to vision care in, and health in an ethnically diverse neighborhood with overall low SES. <clears throat> our overall long-term goal is to improve the general understanding of health inequity and inform public health interventions for positive change with this work. <clears throat> One of the things that was really fun to do um, with the group, so with, with our CWRU team and with the University Settlement team is to work with a designer to create a logo that we felt like encompassed what was really important to us in this study, which we called All Eyes on Us. So you'll see personal community engage, integration, vision, and diversity. And we actually made stickers and put this on the materials that we gave to cab members that we'll talk about in a few minutes. <clears throat> but it really helped center us whenever we would come to meetings and talk about this work and, and kind of let everything else go that we're thinking about in the day, right? And then say like, okay, I'm here to talk about all eyes on us. I'm here to focus on that. And what are the things that are really important for me? <clears throat> and those are the things that are in the logo. Here's an overview of the timeline of our project. We've talked about university settlement. Um, and then if you fast forward to October of 2020, um, that was when one of our analyses was finished. But you can see here, there is a whole lot 
that goes into this project that has gone into this project and it actually is continuing we probably need an ellipses at the end of this um, to show what we're still working on but really important to note is that the project obviously spanned more than the one year that we had funding through the ctsc um, which was incredibly wonderful to have that support um, but it is um, it's tough to get something done in a year so um, these are the the major points throughout the project and um, I think it's important to note those. <clears throat> okay, so working with university settlement, having our expectations already laid out, one of the roles for the university settlement staff was to help us identify folks to recruit for our cab. So this is an example of a flyer that, um, that we used and then we have pictures here of the two buildings um, from which University Settlement operates down in Broadway Slavic Village. And it was really wonderful to be able to partner with University Settlement staff to help have them help us identify folks who they felt like would be good representative community members that would be able to engage with us and commit to the work that we were doing. Because the work that we were doing wasn't just one meeting. It was actually three meetings. Um, so recruiting the cab took a couple of weeks. And then we had one cab meeting per month over the summer of 2019. <clears throat> the, gen the general outline of those meetings um, is shown here. We had relationship building activities in all sessions. And really importantly is that we always started with dinner and that was to foster community building. Um, we wanted to build those relationships between the Case Western team and the actual cab authentically. And part of doing that was sitting down and having a meal together. Um, and important to know also is what we did before we got to the research, we focused on the processes that we were going to use and the ways in which we were going to communicate with one another before we even introduced really much about the study. So in CAD meeting one, one of the things that we were really intentional about is how we set up the room. <clears throat> and, and each meeting beyond that we did as well. But coming from the background that I come from, this is not stuff that I would have ever thought about, right? And so I just want to highlight again the value of having people from all these different backgrounds. This is one of the things that the PRC brought to the table is I would not have had any clue how to do this, right? Um, setting up a room for power, having the table in the shape of a U rather than an I, so that there's really no head of the table. We interspersed ourselves. So we sat team members, interspersed with cab members, interspersed with university settlement staff, because we wanted it to feel like it was the collective table of the, of the group together, not the Case Western table that we were just inviting the cab to. One of the main things that we focused on in the first CAB meeting was communication styles using um, the DISC model. This was this allowed us to all sort of get an understanding of the ways in which we communicate with one another and so that we could understand how people default when they're talking so that it wasn't, we, we weren't taking things as, as personally or directed in a way that um, would have been offensive. We were just trying to understand where people, where their default is, like where they come, where they coming from. Another important exercise that we did is we looked at uh, team values. So we had people, we had everybody look at the list of values that's shown here. We had them pick, I think, ten, and then we had them work together to reduce it down to five, and then we put those five from different groups, um, different subgroups, all together, and came back at the next meeting with what are the top five values that we want to have for this project. <clears throat> so another thing that we did at CAB meeting one, the PRC has a network of community advisors governing guidelines document, and they allowed us to edit this together. So us, Case Western, as well as the CAB members to figure out what we wanted to come to the table with, what the expectations were from, from them for us, from us for them. And the goal was this, the goal of this was to really manage expectations from both sides. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we did bring it to the meeting, um, but we 
to the first meeting, but we also wanted feedback from the cab members on how it needed to be edited to make room for, for what their expectations were. We wanted to feel that all the perspectives were represented. And so then in the second meeting, we actually brought the um, governing guidelines back um, and, and made sure that they were fine with that before moving forward. <clears throat> we did have a list of expectations in terms of participation. So one meeting a month for three months, a timeline of the work, and it's important to note that it was, we didn't expect them to just come to the meetings and participate, but to actively participate um, through the process. And um, so at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end, one of the things that some of the cab members did is, is kind of flag people down at university settlement events and tell them, you know, about the study, uh, which you'll hear more about later. Um, we wanted to make sure to facilitate their sense of ownership of the work because it's obviously not just our work, it's our, it's our collective work together as a group. Each of, in each of the CAB uh, meetings, um, but the first two, we had homework, um, and that was just to get them thinking about the work that we were going to do. And I'm going to play an audio clip quickly. Yeah, I was honored, first of all, to be asked to um, participate right, exactly. in, in something of such importance. And exactly. I just thought it was wonderful that people are, are truly interested in, in what's going on. And so the reason I wanna play that particular clip here is, is to make a note that, you know, I, I hear folks in my field um, complain about different groups not coming to the table, not wanting to be involved in research. But I think, you know, it's a two way street. We really have to figure out ways to engage different groups. And that means maybe not doing everything the same way that it's always been done. Our cab was incredible. I tear up just hearing their voices because I miss them so much. Um, they were so wonderful to allow us into their space and allow us to learn from them but they were also happy that we were asking them questions that we could. Yeah, I was honored, first of all. Okay, cab meeting two. We started our second meeting with those top values, which were honesty, respect, commitment, knowledge, and teamwork. We wanted to remind everyone um, of those, of our shared commitment, what grounds us in the work and how we work together. Um, and then um, we started going through the interview guide <clears throat> part of the homework in um, part of, yeah, part of uh, CAB meeting two was to review that homework. So you can see on this slide here, it's what does vision health mean to you on a scale of one to three? How important are your routine vision screening appointments? Do any of your family have members have vision problems, but simply ignore them? How many questions like this were important? Um, one of the things that we learned through this process was um, the, we needed to have a common understanding of key terms and ideas um, in order to be able to share experiences and lay the foundation to discuss our study interview guide. I'm going to play another audio clip. I thank you also for asking. And uh, it's amazing how it never occurred to me about how important it was for maybe other people. All I knew was it important for my eyes. But right, I mean, it's so important to get involved, and it's uh, so many other things too. But glasses and eyes, it had never occurred to me. I just didn't think about it as being so important for people who are not able to, you know, to do this to get glasses and maybe insurance and things like that, and to know the difference between the doctors. Okay, and then in CAB meeting three, um, we, uh, one of the things that we also did was discuss why we were here. So each person at the table talking about why they're in the room, why they're at this meeting. Another thing that we did was revisit our values. We um, made sure to talk about jargon that was in the interview guide and make sure that uh, they felt that the interview guide was accessible and understandable. Um, we went over some things that we had put on what's what we called a bike rack during the other meetings. So things that maybe we didn't have time to talk about in those meetings, because one of the things that we did is try to stick to a, a particular time frame. So I think it was an hour and a half. We wanted to be respectful of their time. 
And so we really did try to be very efficient with the meetings. Um, and then we discussed dissemination of our findings, um, what that would look like, um, education information for their community, um, the presentation to the community, which unfortunately we haven't been able to do because of the pandemic, and then writing for academic journals, which we're in the process of doing. Another important thing to mention, mention is that in addition to the folder of materials um, that CAB members were given, um, and then the big gift cards that they were presented with um, as you know, a thank you for the time that they gave towards this project. We also presented them with a certificate of appreciation to recognize their contribution. Um, and yeah, we did provide that dinner and that small stipend, but this is just like an additional element to show our appreciation and recognition of their involvement. Um, making sure that they understood that the ways in which they showed up despite everything going on in their lives, but we appreciated them. Um, so for example, if car broke down um, and they were still able to show up, maybe one of the university settlement staff went and got them, um, or if they were running late because they were, you know, there was a daycare issue. I mean, there, were, there was just so many things that these folks overcame to be able to be at these tables with us um, and help us do this work. This is a photo from our final meeting. Um, we just absolutely love our cab. Um, and unfortunately, due to the pandemic, this was actually the last time that all of us, the Case Western team and the University Settlement team and the cab were all together. Um, I'm gonna play one more audio clip and then I'm gonna transition to uh, Dr. Koopman and Douglas. It was pretty enlightening to me. I enjoyed that. Especially when it comes to, you know, trying to help the community. It was pretty in life. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the development of the interview guide throughout those three CAB meetings that we had. So our interview guide, the first version that we came um, up with and brought to that first meeting was modified from the National Eye Institute Visual Functioning Questionnaire, the VFQ 25. And open-ended questions were developed to examine in-depth content areas that were identified in that questionnaire. In the first meeting with the CAB, we introduced qualitative interview methodologies. And at the end of that meeting, the interview guide draft was given to the CAB members and they were asked to review the guide and before the second CAB meeting. In the second meeting, Sorry. In the second meeting, we uh, had a discussion around the questions and the guide and the uh, CAB members were asked to give their feedback. And we, as we were going through the, um, we asked them certain questions to help guide that feedback as well to help inform the interview guide. So some of the questions we asked them were about the meaning of eyesight and healthy vision for them their thoughts on vision care, what they thought about the interview guide, including what they liked or disliked, how we could better ask some questions to get at information around vision care and access, as well as additional topics that they would suggest for us to add to the guide around this topic. So after that second meeting, we went back to, we took um, the suggestions in that discussion and used it to inform and make changes to the interview guide. So some of the suggestions included um, around interview flow and question order. So we moved the order of some of the questions. Include, for example, we moved general perception questions around eye health and vision health to before questions that were about participants' personal health. CAM members also discussed additional topics to include, such as those um, around how eyesight affects their, their ability to do different activities. The CAB also gave us suggestions around wording of some of the questions. So one edit that we made based on the discussion was the demographic question, what is your race? And this was changed in the guide to be, how would you describe your race? In the third meeting, um, we first, the CAB members listened to a mock interview that our team did um, using a portion of the edited questionnaire so they could get a feel for how it um, went when 
not just reading it, but kind of hearing the interaction. Then the CAB reviewed the interview guide um, again with these edits. We highlighted the edits in the interview guide so they could see that and ask for additional feedback on it. No, we didn't do the interview. We, okay. I had to explain that to some people at the center too. They like, well, you didn't go in there for your interview. I said, well, I, I'm one of them who helped develop the questions. It was a group of us, a committee. And okay. and we got together and, and decided on questions. But you right. I said, but I made the questions. What what good is it gonna do to interview me? Right. So it was some people who right. they was they really wanted me to go in there and be interviewed and I'm like, right. it wouldn't do any good. Right. I already know all the questions. <laughs> so as um heard in that uh the CAB members really um, helped for us to create and we co-developed this interview guide together um, and had that shared ownership over it. Um, so we there were some additional um, edits that were made after that third meeting and the additional feedback. Um, for example, we added statements throughout the interview to let participants know about the reasons for certain questions. And then we also added some questions to expand on some content areas um, as suggested by the CAB members. So for example, we added questions around in insurance selection um, into our um, content area of insurance. So now I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Kennedy. Um, he'll discuss more about the team's engagement in the community. So um, before our recruitment even started, um, our team began going to events and programs at University Settlement and within Broadway Slavic Village so that the neighborhood residents and the people at University Settlement were familiar with us. Um, as we mentioned, we felt it was important for them to see us as part of the community, not just as outsiders coming in, using them for research and then leaving. So on the next couple of slides, you'll see some photos of us at various events. Um, the bottom slide or the bottom photo here is us at senior prom. One of our cab members was crowned prom queen. Um, and then you'll see a few examples um, of other events that we've participated in. And then on the next slide, you'll hear from Marcia who mentions some of the different events in the neighborhood. When COVID isn't around, we had like, um, when COVID isn't around, we had like um, a homecoming and we had Taste of Slavic Village. Um, so as Marcia mentioned before COVID, we were able to attend, be part of homecoming week, senior prom, community meals on Tuesday evenings, neighborhood development meetings. That's us at Thanksgiving dinner on the left there. Um, different events at the senior center. We wrapped Christmas presents and more. And then on the next slide, you'll hear from Marcia again about how meaningful it has been to develop the relationships that we have and cultivate them. I, I remember personally, I don't know if it was Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner. Y'all showed up and just came in and took over serving for us because <laughs> right. it was such, it was, oh my goodness, it was really hectic. And, and Case came in and just took over serving and, and it was wonderful to see you there and and to um know that it, you wasn't case wasn't just there to to get questions from us and they were sincerely concerned with our neighborhood and our people to the point where they was getting out there serving us it, it was good to see and it wasn't just that it was the christmas the toy thing and to, to see you everywhere, it was it was wonderful. Everywhere I looked up, somebody from Case Western Reserve was there when it was involving our community, and and that was really really refreshing. And um, 
I can tell people that somebody's weary about something about the study or anything. I can tell them, well, those people didn't just ask us questions and, and use us to get answers and stuff. Those people came and genuinely helped us. Right. And we appreciate it. I think we really appreciated and enjoyed being part of their community as much as they enjoyed, appreciated being- I, I remember community. personally. Those memories are um, just so vivid we missed and so them. fun. <laughs> so fun. Like y'all brought so much joy to us. And when I was saying that we have missed you so much, like that's, that's part of it. We just miss being in the community. So as you can see from these experiences that we wanted our intentions to be clear that we are there, we were there and we are there for more than just research. It's important for us to gain the trust of the neighborhood. So before we ask them to do anything for us, we wanted to be able to do for them um, and know that, let them know that we'll continue to do that after the research is over. Um, when COVID permits, we'll be bringing our findings back to um, Broadway Slavic Village and University Settlement. But we won't just be, you know, giving them the information. Um, we will be, you know, we'll let them know um, how they can improve their community as well. So um, when then we still won't be leaving. We'll still be attending events, going to programs, showing up at University Settlement for Tuesday night dinners, wrapping presents at Christmas, the relationships that we've built will continue. So I'm gonna transition over a little bit to talking about um, the interviews. Um, what we did, we first had, first we had to make sure that our team was prepared to do interviews. So um, Dr. Kubin Gonzalez um, gave us some training. Um, interview prep included knowing how to introduce and explain the study, adapt to the situation, listening intently, probing techniques, techniques for developing rapport, um, diminishing bias, how to guide the conversation, how to answer interviewee questions, and then how to end the interviews. Um, some participants were initially hesitant to participate because maybe they would say, I don't know anything about eyes or I don't wear glasses. Um, but we assured them all information is good information. So not knowing about services in your neighborhood is helpful for us to know because that's something that we can address. Um, and not knowing about eyes or eye health is also good information. Gives us a place to start when we think about education and interventions. Interviews were done at University Settlement to make it easier for our participants. Many of them completed their interviews while they were already at University Settlement for senior programming or produce day or some other activity. Um, and University Settlement has two different buildings. We offered times at both buildings. Participants completed an informed consent form. were given a copy to take home um, and before any interview activities began. The interviews were audio recorded, which was part of the informed consent. And each consent and interview process was conducted in a private room with a closed door. There was one interviewer and one note taker present in each interview. So this was important for our quality assurance. And we also used this system in case we had a failure or a problem with the audio, which did happen twice. The interviews ranged in time from 20 minutes to over an hour. Um, all the audio was uploaded to Box. It was transcribed by, by Temi, which is an audio to text automatic transcription software. And then it was checked for quality control by two team members. And then the transcriptions were uploaded to um, Envivo, which is a qualitative data analysis software. Um, Dr. Kuming Gonzalez will talk more about our analysis process shortly. And then here's just an overview of our participation, our participant demographics. So just to note that there um, are more females, which is not super surprising for um, research participation. Um, the income and the education level, as well as the Hispanic to non-Hispanic ratio fits the general neighborhood makeup. 
Um, and then now I'll give it back over to Dr. Caitlin Gonzalez, who will talk about our analysis. So our initial code book, we developed based on the interview guide. And then we, um, two team members, Dr. Kennedy and myself, we started to code the transcripts and we discussed coding discrepancies as well as emerging codes. The emergent codes were added to the code book and code definitions were edited based on these discussions. Transcripts were coded by both team members until the code book was finalized. In total, we added 10 emerging codes and some of them included like eyesight importance. And after the fourth interview, no additional codes were added. We created outputs of all segments from interviews for each of the codes and then developed summaries to note any themes both within codes as well as themes that crossed different codes. Oops, sorry. So our findings were reviewed by team members to um, discuss the interpretations that were made of the data. We also, during check-in calls, CAB members were individually asked about their thoughts on the findings around barriers to care and reasons for going to the eye doctor. The CAB members um, agreed with the findings. We did intend to get all of the CAB members back uh, together um, to have this discussion, but unfortunately couldn't due to COVID. All of the analyses um, in conducting were aimed at our second aim. And we wanted to overall in this aim answer these three research questions. So many, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual results. Um, these are just some of the results that came from this study. Many participants described how eyesight is important and as a reason to take care of their eyes and go to the eye doctor. Additionally, participants described that eyesight is important for being able to do activities they need, want, and enjoy, such as reading, driving, recreational activities, and working. Participants also um, described things that would impact their eyesight, such as um, using screens, health issues like diabetes, injuries, aging, genetic and family history, as well as environmental factors. Participants um, also discussed the reasons for going to the eye doctor, such as having, if they were having any issues when their prescription needed um, updating, but also um, some of the barriers for going to the eye doctor for both themselves as well as for others. While insurance was identified as a barrier by participants for going to the eye doctor, participants in our study reported knowing about their eye insurance coverage. Most of the participants reported having Medicaid and they also discussed how they selected their particular um, coverage. Some mentioned hearing about information from their senior building or having assistance selecting a care plan through that as well. Um, additionally, family was mentioned as having an influence on what was selected. Some participants also mentioned that they were disappointed with their limited options, um, particularly around availability of glasses options um, when it came to their insurance coverage. So the results that um, I've presented really address the first research question of how do lower SES individuals conceptualize and value their vision and prioritize vision care? The analysis is still in process to answer those uh, question two and question three um, due to some challenges which Dr. Kennedy will describe next. Okay, sorry. Get off the mute. We we did have some um, practical issues uh, around recruitment. Um, 
Not sure why my slide isn't. Oops. Okay. Okay. We did have some practical issues around recruitment um, due to, you know, cultural and power differences, as well as trust issues. It can be harder to um, recruit African Americans um, sometimes, especially in racially segregated areas. Um, however, Broadway Slavic Village is pretty uh, racially equal, and we found it harder to recruit self-identified Caucasian individuals. Um, there's also an issue of space. So University Settlement offers an abundance of services spread between two different buildings. In the picture on the lower left where the pin is dropped, you can see um, where University Settlement's main building is. And then across the grassy area, the building surrounded by trees there is their um, secondary building. So they're close uh, to each other, but if you have mobility issues, you know, it can be hard to get to one or the other, and they do have to cross a main road. Um, and then of course the focus of university settlement is community services. And while they were eager partners in our study, their priority is to their um, clients' needs. So they were able to offer us some rooms, um, a dedicated room and usually a second room. But um, however, sometimes they just needed the space that we had set up. Um, and sometimes it was confusing for participants to know which building their interview was in. But we were able to resolve all of that um, just by keeping in constant contact with university settlement staff as well as participants. And then transcription, we dedicated a certain number of hours and time um, allowed for transcription. However, the intensity of the time needed for transcription was a bit more than we anticipated. And we also experienced some challenges due to COVID, which I'm sure we all have. Um, on the next slide, you'll hear from Marcia and Jean, who mention how grateful they are for the services that University Settlement continues to provide. Since we're not at University Settlement, uh -huh. where everybody, everybody does Zoom meetings. Yeah, they're trying to give us something to do. Which is wonderful, because they could have deserted us. Right. I'm sure I'm sure a lot of centers did do that. Right. You got that right. So, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm glad we have the people that we have because they did yeah. keep up with us. Right. That's true. So um, as we all know, in March 2020, Case Western shut down in-person research activities. Luckily, we had finished our interviews in late February 2020. Um, but we had planned, you know, a community event and er, and presentation um, disseminating our findings in May 2020, which has unfortunately been placed on hold indefinitely. And then University Settlement has had some changes during the last two years as well. They've had to shift their focus from providing services um, to the seniors, youth, parents, community members in-house to providing some of their services remotely. We've had some Zoom meetings with Allison Woods, who's the adult wellness program manager. And she has um, let us know how uh, University Settlement is delivering meals, activity kits, and sometimes even computers to the seniors. Um, so Allison and other staff, they're in constant contact with the seniors. And then we've been able to receive updates to our CAB members through Allison as well. I've also been in contact with the CAB via phone. And then we've um, had a Zoom meeting with them as well. Um, Dr. Koopman is also be going over some of our findings in more detail, but I presented each CAB member with a few ideas and then got their thoughts about what we found. Um, and then I spoke to each of them about their ideas on disseminating our findings since the presentation event is on hold. So we're committed to maintaining our relationships with the CAB, with University Settlement, and with Broadway Slavic Village during COVID-19. We look forward to getting back to seeing them in person. Since we're not at university, since we're not. Jessica, I think you're next. 
Okay, sorry about that. So I told you you'd see this beautiful timeline again. Um, hopefully you can appreciate all the time and work that went into this um, from our amazing team members, including our amazing cab. Um, obviously COVID put a damper on uh, what we wanted to do, but I think uh, Dr. Kennedy did a great job of, of overviewing the things that, that we hope that we have done and then we hope to do, and, and really hopefully this summer we'll be able to do a community engagement event where we disseminate our findings. Um, so getting back to, to my story, which is how I told you I was, I was going to present this, um, I can say now that instead of the very biological model that I showed at the beginning, I really have much more of an appreciation for how complicated disease risk can be um, for POAG as well as other diseases. Um, there are certain factors that are going to be set at birth, but there are also risk mitigators um, over the lifespan that we need to consider maybe in a more holistic view before we make grand assumptions about um, the causes of risk. Um, one exciting thing that's happening um, because of this work is that it's informing some of the clinical studies that we uh, have planned for um, the future. Let me, I'm gonna play an audio clip, I think. It has been our honor to work with all of you, um, you. and for you to allow us into, you know, the space that is your thoughts and your feelings and just all of these things. I really cannot tell you how much this group and this work has changed, like what I want to do and where I want to go. It's always weird to listen to yourself <laughs> on audio um, recorded, but it really, I think, I think, um, you know, that quote general genuinely captures how I, how I feel about this. Um, about this work. So the common theme of all of the studies that we described today is that uh, you know community engaged research enables us to consider and elucidate, elucidate a more comprehensive understanding of disease. Um, this isn't something that I would have been able to articulate or even really consider as very useful uh, before undertaking this project. Um, we truly believe that community engaged research provides that essential bridge, so thus the bridge on the slide, between research teams like ours and the communities that we hope to serve with our findings. Um, we clearly demonstrated here that transdisciplinary teams together with community partners can contribute to unique perspectives um, of the development of a clinical research study. It has been our honor to work with all of you, um, you. and for you to allow us. Okay. Um, and as I've hopefully shown you today, the voices of the community shape each part of this study and the lessons that we've learned have shaped um, our research team going forward. Um, some more pictures of us at events. At the end of the day, the community needs to be at the heart of community-based research. Um, and this is encompassed by the quote, nothing about us without us. Nothing about us can be achieved without all of us being engaged in the research. And that's how we look at that. Okay, and now I'm going to pass it over quickly to Dr. Waxminski. Okay, so recognizing the importance of giving the knowledge we've learned through the All Eyes on Us studies back to the community that we've gained so much of this knowledge from, one of our next steps steps is to disseminate the All Eyes on Us study findings to the CAB and community members that we worked with, including in virtual and remote ways in light of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, or hopefully in-person ways um, once it's safer to gather together in person. At one of our virtual CAB meetings, we asked the CAB members themselves about what types of presentations or dissemination activities and events they would recommend for their community, and these were two suggestions that they gave us that I have here as audio clips. Slavic Village has a newspaper. Yeah. And and that would be one way of, of reaching just about everybody because the papers are in the stores and, and all over and people do get them and read them. I have a doctor or um, someone come out and explain the difference and the, the jobs of each of the ophthalmologists, the optometrist, and um, optician, because they all three of them got different jobs. 
So these were just a few of the suggestions we heard from our CAB members that we're going to work with uh, moving forward to see how best to disseminate this information back to them and their community. In addition to sharing our findings with our community partners and members of the Broadway Slavic Village community in general, we plan to share our research results with the research community more broadly through publications and presentations like the one we've been able to share with you today. As a part of our next steps, we also plan to seek additional funding opportunities to expand our current All Eyes on Us study to continue to learn more about the perceptions of eye health and barriers to seeking vision care in Cleveland and beyond. We are also starting to apply the valuable lessons we've learned through the All Eyes on Us study to our other glaucoma focused studies that our team is currently working on. For instance, the qualitative interview findings from the All Eyes on Us study inform the surveys that we are now currently using as a part of our study integrating glaucoma health translation or SIGHT. The ultimate goal of SIGHT is to understand the comprehensive risk profile for glaucoma, specifically primary open angle glaucoma or POAG that Dr. Fafeli described earlier, with a focus specifically on minority populations, particularly those that as she mentioned are most affected by glaucoma but have been historically underrepresented in biomedical research in general. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brie McIntosh to wrap up the rest of the presentation and talk about how we are expanding all eyes on us beyond the Cleveland area. Thank you. Um, so we are in the process of expanding our lessons learned from All Eyes on Us study into Jamaica. Uh, we're working closely with clinical collaborators and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence around um, the, the presence of glaucoma and it's often called a glaucoma gold mine. However, there's no contemporary epidemiologic data available in Jamaica. Um, this type of data would not only help inform clinical practice, but it would also enable a large public health education campaign and resource allocation through programming and policy. This study has been significantly delayed due to COVID-19. However, we've made great progress in um, chart review and being able to sort of complete in one of our study, which is to create a clinical profile of glaucoma in a sample population of patients from a tertiary eye care center. Um, we would also like to develop a community advisory board for this study that would ultimately help um, a accomplish the goals he listed here, which are to evaluate clinical data of glaucoma patients, to establish the feasibility of an island-wide study through community-based screening events, assess the willingness of clinical and community populations to participate in future research studies, and also then use the aforementioned information to inform glaucoma risk education materials for both patients and families, because we often know that uh, glaucoma patients need to rely on caretakers and sort of a family unit in order to um, uh, prevent, not only prevent, but um, manage their, their eye care disease. Next, Jessica. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so I just want to make sure that we acknowledge all of our funders and supporters, um, obviously University Settlement, um, the PRCHN, the CTSC, uh, the School of Medicine Department, and the Cleveland Institute for Computational Biology, as well as the KL2 um, and the T32 and TL1, um, and then of course our Allies on Us research team. Thank you so much for being here today and uh, learning with us. It's really exciting for us to share this work with you. Um, and you know, I hope that by doing this in this in this format um, in this forum, that we, you know we can get feedback from all of you, uh, we, which we certainly welcome. Thanks for being here today. For any questions, if you'd like to raise your hand, you can ask the questions with your audio or in the chat. And also Dr. Trapp always does this, but it would be great if everyone could turn their camera on and give the presenters a nice 
Round of applause. <laughs> I'm just checking the um, the chat because I had like 26 things on red. Okay, so there's not any questions in there. Um, well, if you think of questions, please do reach out to, obviously we have a large team um, and uh, we would love you know to have any comments or input, suggestions. Um, it's a really exciting um, project and I'm really delighted to have been able to present uh, to this, this group today, thanks. Meredith has a question. I, I just could not say how impressed I am. I thought this was fabulous. I, I love the way you did this. I love that, Jessica, you said you're new to this process, but yet it do, didn't seem like it for a second. You did things like textbook wise. I could see your KL2 training coming through. Um, you picked a great partner in um, University Settlement. They do this in a very great way. We had the opportunity to work with them as well. And I think they, I just think they're so invested in this and, and really um, manage those relationships with the researchers really well. So I was very impressed. I'm super excited to keep following what you guys are doing and congratulations. Oh, and sorry, my heart's barking. Congratulations. It's sort of, it was, it did not come naturally. Well, some of it, some of it comes naturally, but it wasn't something that, you know, most of us uh, on, from my team anyway, from the CICB had training in. it's, it's something that, you know, we learned from, from Erica and Sarah KG and, and then Sarah Kennedy, like bringing these different perspectives to the table. It's been so fabulous. I really cannot see another way of ever doing research, you know, not having a diverse group. Like I, I, I can't. wanted to compliment you guys and say kudos for taking pictures and integrating your cab voices into it um into your presentation because that really really gave a very like personal touch to it and gave feelings that maybe couldn't be put to words if if we didn't directly hear um directly from what you guys experienced in those moments so thank you for that Thanks, Rachel. I, I think Andrea deserves a lot of the credit for that. Um, there were hours, hours spent going through um, how to edit audio files and how to embed them in a PowerPoint. And then how do we get them to play when we're sharing our someone else's screen? I mean, but it, it really, I'm really glad that you found value in that too, because like I said, I tear up when I hear them talking. I miss them so much, but it's really lovely to have their voices in there too. If we were in person, we would love to bring them right to the presentation but you know we've all had to get real creative with COVID. I definitely teared up and in, in my part when Marcia talks about like everywhere I looked up you were there I started getting teary-eyed and I was like you're not done talking you have, you have to calm down <laughs> <laughs> but it's just nice to know you know that they liked being, having us as much as we liked being there. And I think it also shows, this is something that um, we learned with the reach work at the PRC is that investing time on the front end um, before project activities start or recruitment or your grant goals start really does pay off um, in terms of that engagement processing and, and building those relationships. So even though it said, oh, we didn't know what we were doing, you are humans, right? And I think human first and connecting with folks, um, you know how to communicate. And I think in, everyone can take note of that when trying to achieve research goals um, by moving a little bit slower and understanding that those will pay off in the long run and shown in the data, but in the results and the dissemination and community and clinical uptake of what we're trying to achieve. So. I wasn't involved in the team in the beginning, but I'm very proud of you all for taking that time. And having that engagement definitely improved the um, the science of it to um, the questions we had. They were 
they got at the questions that we needed to ask and things that we hadn't thought of as a research team, the CAV brought those in. And so I think that really just enhanced the scientific um, output of this project, which was very exciting. And I think the community engagement all throughout, not just in the CAV meetings, but just really created that buy-in of our project. So it's fantastic to work on. We went as long as a traditional PRC seminar in the basement. So good job. <laughs> Sorry, there was no lunch provided today. Though. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Our next seminar is going to be on March 9th. Um, for looking at the Fresh Finder interactive food access map. And those details are on the PRC website. And you'll get information in the listserv through email. So thank you all for coming today.